southeast Oklahoma, rugged mountains, endless, dark, dense pine and oak forests. It's hard to imagine this landscape has ever looked anything different. But 200 years ago, early explorers journaled their travels through this area as lush prairie valleys with scattered timbered ridge tops and a notable abundance of wildlife, hardly how explorers would describe it today. When it comes to wildlife species like the white-tailed deer, this habitat is no longer living up to its potential. So what's caused such a dramatic change? Well, long ago, we stopped using one of our most effective management tools. We as a society are gripped with the fear of wildfire. For generations, land managers have fought to the death to snuff out every last spark on public lands. It's only recently that science has changed its tune. It's been the lack of fire that has so visibly changed southeast Oklahoma. Prescribed fire is a very important part of the ecosystem. There's many benefits from different wildlife species and the vegetation out here that, uh, that you can get from prescribed burning. For example, down here on the forest floor, you see there's a whole bunch of pine needles and hardwood needles. They're very thick and plants, forbs, grasses can't grow through these. So one of the benefits of prescribed burning is to clear off the forest floor from all these pine needles and hardwood needles, return the nutrients to the soil so that it benefits the plants that will grow here in the growing season. You'll bring back a lot of grasses, a lot of forbs that are beneficial to deer, turkey, quail, and a lot of different animals that, that use that habitat type. Here in McCurtain County, we have a lot of different understory species which are beneficial to wildlife. This one here happens to be a hickory, which provides a nut for squirrels to feed on. You can see that the stem here is pretty thick. The fire coming through here won't necessarily kill this tree. This tree is probably a little bit too big for the fire to kill. So just because we put prescribed fire out here in the woods doesn't mean that all the trees are going to die, and it doesn't mean that there's not going to be anything for the wildlife to, to eat. If you look down here, we have what's called a panicum grass. There's a little bit of an opening right here in the canopy where this grass has been able to get a hold, but it's not widespread in here because of the thick canopy. So the hopes of prescribed burning is to open up the canopy, allow more of this kind of grass to grow. Again, a panicum grass is very beneficial for deer, turkey, quail. It's like the ice cream of the animal world to them. So if we can create a habitat that has more of these kind of species, rather than some of the undesirable species that maybe won't be as nutritious or palatable to wildlife, then we feel that the prescribed burn has, has served its benefit. This is an area that we prescribed burn earlier today. If you look around, you see a lot of black on the ground and a lot of black on the trees. If you look over here at this tree, you'll see black from, the, from this part of the trunk down. This fire did not damage this tree. The fire came through here and scarred the trunk to where you see nothing but black on the bottom of this tree, but the inside was not damaged. Thus, this tree is still living. If you see right here, the fire burned all the way down to the soil. It burned all those pine needles and hardwood leaves that were covering this dirt. What that does is acts as a fertilizer. It returns nutrients to the soil, nutrients such as calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, the same kind of nutrients that you would find in a fertilizer that you would put on your garden. So with your garden, you would expect increased results with your fruits and vegetables. Out here in the woods, we would expect the same thing. We would expect increased results with growth of new green grass, growth of new forbs, growth of new tree species. 
um, species such as the indigo, species such as the panicum grasses that are beneficial to wildlife, we would expect an increase of those kind of species here because the nutrients will return to the soil through this prescribed burn. This tree is another hickory. This hickory is about the same size as the last hickory we saw. If you look down at the base again, you'll see the black scars, just like we did on the, the pine tree. But this tree is not dead. This tree is thick enough and big enough to resist the kind of fire that came through here today. On the other hand, here we have a clump of hickories. We've got one, two, three hickories right here next to each other. These small trees aren't as resilient to the fire. The fire killed these trees. It's this kind of habitat that we're trying to reduce in this area. We don't want thick clumps of trees, thick clumps of grass, thick clumps of briars growing in any one spot. We're trying to open up these areas so that other species that might be more beneficial to our wildlife come in in their place. This area was prescribed burn under specific weather conditions that were monitored throughout the day. In a few short weeks, you'll see a lot of new green growth out here, which is going to be very beneficial to wildlife. The numbers of wildlife and the diversity of wildlife in this burn stand is going to be much greater than that found in the unburned stand. Certain wildlife species have evolved to depend on the effects of fire in their habitat. When fire is eliminated from the area, that species' survival is then put in jeopardy. Such is the case with a federally listed endangered red cockaded woodpecker in the McCurtain County Wilderness Area. Red cockaded woodpeckers are colony nesters of old growth pine forest, and it's the only woodpecker to nest in live trees. They also need a fairly open mid-story canopy to easily fly from nest to nest. Years ago, when fire was suppressed from this area, mid-story canopy trees increased and the little red cockaded woodpecker began to suffer. Fortunately, through extensive management of this area, which includes frequent prescribed burning, there is hope on the horizon for the red cockaded woodpecker. We now know that fire is an essential ingredient of a healthy, natural ecosystem. But we can take this even one step further. By controlling how frequent a piece of land is burned, the area can be managed to effectively reach its potential for wildlife. Pushmataha Wildlife Management Area hosts a unique prescribed burning study conducted in cooperation with researchers from Oklahoma State University. The research is helping us discover how to fine-tune prescribed burning for specific wildlife species. OSU researcher Ron Masters gives us a tour of the experiment sites. This area looks much like what much of southeast Oklahoma looks like after it's been harvested by timber. Many private landowners will go into an area and harvest the timber and just let it regrow without having to go through the expense of planting and preparing a site and, and going through all that. As we look at this area, currently there is very little use by any species of wildlife in this particular treatment. Again, this area is unburned. We had to use it as an unburned control to compare plant succession and, and wildlife production to our areas that we will go to later that had been burned. As you can see, the area has come back in a very dense stand of mixed pine and hardwood. The, uh, the dense overstory now is shading out the, the forage that we once had as this area went through plant succession. It provides very limited benefit in terms of white-tailed deer for forage production. Early on, we had about a 10-year window where it provided uh, beneficial cover for white-tailed deer, uh, a cover component is very important for them, one where they feel secure. We're beyond that at this point in time. It's starting to open up a little bit, but again, the dense canopy uh, shading things out, shading out the understory forage, it's creating a different structure uh, that has limited benefit, and again, the benefit was only short term uh, in terms of wildlife. From a timber management perspective, this is not the wisest use of our land. The trees here are crowded, they're stunted and they're growing very poorly. There's intense competition for nutrients. 
Uh, these sites in southeast Oklahoma are of poor quality to begin with, and you're putting additional stress on the trees. So we would like to see a little more open area if we're going to manage this area for timber. And I would encourage landowners uh, to seriously consider consulting with a forester when they harvest their timber so we don't get a situation like this that provides uh, neither benefits in the long term for wildlife or for forest management and forest health. This is another one of our units. This is a harvest thin and four year burn. The only difference between this particular unit and the last one we were in is that we've added fire. Fire has had a dramatic influence. We've had four four year burns at this point in time. One of the different things that you can see is the abundance of uh, browse such as wing sumac for white-tailed deer. We also have blackberry. We have an incredible diversity of uh, grasses, forbs, uh, legumes, uh, different forage plants that are, that are very beneficial to, to white-tailed deer. One of the interesting things is this treatment has progressed has been the fact that the shortleaf pine, which is a fire adapted species, uh, is developing even with the use of fire on this area. It has a very thick insulated bark and it's one of the few pine species that will re-sprout following fire. This frequency of fire uh, is very good for development of a stand. As you can see, this we have opened, uh, this area has developed as, as a more open aspect than our, our last treatment. Forge production has increased uh, on the order of uh, 15 times of what it was in our unburned control. We have woody browse, which is preferred by white-tailed deer. We also find that in this burn scenario, we have wild turkeys nesting in here as well. Quail will periodically use this, although it's a little bit too brushy for quail. It has a, a longer-term benefit uh, in terms of maintaining this area in more of a brushy state. One of the neat things that, that I alluded to earlier is the fact that uh, this shows that we can use prescribed fire as a forest management tool in terms of actually getting regeneration back and controlling regeneration, controlling these pine stems that come back uh, and the density of them, the placement of those. We do get a clumped type distribution of the pines across the area, so it's not like a planted uh, rose of planted pine, but at the same time, uh, we have an adequate number here that a landowner would, uh, could make money on in the future. So by using prescribed fire, by harvesting the timber, utilizing that resource, we have uh, we've benefited wildlife. We have some potential here for future income from timber management. And we would have uh, limited grazing value here for, uh, for livestock. There are certainly other options which would, would be better in this part of the state for livestock. But again, it shows the potential, uh, at least at this point in time, for some limited grazing. We have cover for white-tailed deer. We also have uh, a variety of songbirds which use these sites that feed on the uh, American beautyberry seed, on the blackberry seed. So uh, basically, uh, we have done a lot of good things for many species of wildlife by using fire uh, in addition to our timber management. But again, nothing stays the same. And if we were to look at this area right after we harvested the timber and started burning, uh, the area has changed. It has grown up, even with using fire. We often think of fire as being a destructive force. Uh, unjudicial use of uh, wildfire uh, is a problem. And wildlife managers use prescribed fire in a prescribed fashion with specific goals and, and objectives in mind. For example, with this four-year burn unit, our goal is to increase white-tailed deer forage production. And we've done that very dramatically. This is our three-year burn treatment. Again, just like our harvest and thin unit that we started with that was very dense, the only difference between this and that is that we've applied fire at three-year intervals since we started the, the study in uh, 1983. Very evident should be uh, the fact that Structurally, this is much different than the four-year burn and the no-burn treatment. We're starting to lose some of our overstory hardwoods. So if we were wanting to retain hardwoods for mass production, this is not a treatment that we would want. But from a st uh, the standpoint of a white-tailed deer, for example, this unit, uh, this type treatment, 
is what is preferred by white-tailed deer. And there's a couple of reasons for that. As you can see, forage production has increased dramatically over the, the no-burn and, and the four-year burn treatment. We have a lot of brush, a lot of brush woody browse. Deer tend to be browsers. Uh, for most of the part of the year, their diet consists primarily of woody browse, uh, like sumac, greenbrier, uh, various woody species like that. The benefit of a three-year burn, and the reason that they prefer it, is because that three-year interval basically is putting the forage, putting the browse, the woody component on the ground. It's not allowing it uh, to go to grow up into a tree. We're getting some mortality on some of the uh, small diameter hardwoods that, that are struggling up. We, we have less pine regeneration here. Again, this frequency seems to be too much uh, if we were wanting to regenerate pine, for example, on this site. But we have abundant sumac uh, out here as well, some blackberry. Uh, we lose some of the, the woody shrubs, such as American beautyberry. We don't find it as, as prevalent out here as well. Forage production is just dramatically increased. Uh, the, the shrubby, woody cover does provide uh, cover uh, for the deer. But the greatest benefit here for this particular unit uh, if you want to manage for a white-tailed deer in southeast Oklahoma, uh, I would put a carbon copy of this down somewhere because in terms of food production, uh, this treatment is, is unmatched. As well, we've seen red-headed woodpeckers move in on this treatment unit because of the, the snags that have developed from those residual hardwoods that we left. The red-headed woodpecker is an open country bird, uh, and again, they're one of our uh, species that we're concerned about because they've been declining. There's a fire connection in all this for, for many different wildlife species. To manage for different species of wildlife, they are adapted to different structures. The different structures tell them that this is uh, a good place to go to provide nesting habitat, to provide a food source. Also on this three-year burn interval, insect production is, is dramatically greater than it is in the unmanaged forest or in the area without fire. Our next treatment unit, we're basically going to a two-year burn interval. We've gone through a no-burn, four, a three, and now a two-year burn interval. Each one of these has a distinctly different structure uh, that you can see that's created by the influence of fire. For example, going from the top down, looking at the overstory, again, we're losing more of the overstory trees that we left, the, the overstory hardwoods that we left for mass production. As we go down, there's less woody, shrubby cover, and again, the tall grasses, the, the prairie grasses, are beginning to predominate even more and more as we increase fire frequency as we go down to a two-year burn. Uh, this is not the, the choice that I would make if I was gonna manage the forest to regenerate a forest. But if you're into livestock production in this part of the world and actually in the cross timbers or up in uh, northeast Oklahoma, north central Oklahoma, this treatment certainly has some application there if you're into livestock management. At the same time, it's beneficial uh, for various wildlife species. The structure here is different than the units that we've seen. So therefore, because the structure is different, we start seeing different species of wildlife that use this treatment scenario. For example, uh, we have more bobwhite quail. Uh, in the control unit, as we started out, no bobwhite quail used those stands at all. We also see some use of, of turkeys. Uh, turkey broods on this two-year burn. Uh, it's very dense for turkeys, so uh, it's not ideal brood rearing habitat. In terms of deer forage production, the frequency of fire that we're using now, a two-year burn, is actually causing declines in deer forage production. However, we get an abundance of legumes on this particular uh, treatment unit. Therefore, we see quail use increase on this unit as well. So what we're saying is that with a variety of fire frequencies, we, are, uh, we can actually target species that we would like to manage for. This is another one of our burn treatments. It's the one year burn treatment. As we have gone through, uh, everything initially started the same way. We started out with harvesting the pine timber in 1984, and then we thinned the hardwoods to about half of the number of hardwoods on the area. And the only difference is the fire frequency. We've gone from no fire to four, three, two, and now a one-year burn. As you can see, 
with a one-year burn interval, it's just dramatic, the influence that we can have on the plant community by using fire. Imagine, if you will, uh, Thomas Nuttall, when he came through here in 1819, uh, very near to this spot that we're standing, and he describes an area that is uh, dominated by prairies, and the, the mountains are covered by scattered woods, scattered trees, scattered pines and oaks, as, uh, to quote him. You can see that as we've increased fire frequency, we have lowered the number of trees that, that dominate uh, in the overstory. Uh, we've taken some of those out. But at the same time, we've moved all that biomass on the ground. So we have herbaceous dominated plant community now with uh, big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and little blue stem. Uh, the prairie grasses that we're familiar with uh, in tall grass prairie. In fact, this area is very similar to tall grass prairie in terms of species composition. All we've done is harvest the tim timber and apply fire, prescribed fire, at one year intervals. And it's amazing and dramatic the effects that you can get just through application of those natural processes. Uh, in terms of deer forage production, as you can see, uh, we have suppressed the woody part of the plant community on this site because of the frequent burning. But at the same time, we've allowed the prairie grasses, which are adapted to fire, uh, to really come forth and uh, to really uh, exhibit their dominance because they are fire adapted. We've increased the legume component within this uh, one year burn unit dramatically because of, uh, of the frequent fire. It's uh, the fire which breaks that seed coat uh, and also uh, promotes the development of a, a legume understory as it was under this canopy of grasses. We've seen uh, uh, Bob White quail will use this area. Uh, turkey broods when they're up in size, uh, half grown to, to three quarter in size, will come out and use this, this area as bugging areas. White-tailed deer use this as screening cover. Now it's, its value for forage is somewhat limited, but actually in the winter time, we have some low growing panicums which they will uh, dig through and they will use those uh, because they're the only thing that's green. They're a cool season grass. And also sedges are, are very prominent out here as well. So it all works together. Uh, we're talking about a mix of land management practices that we've shown you. We're not talking about applying everything that we've done to one area. Uh, wildlife species are structure dependent and we use fire as a tool to manage that structure, targeting those species that we want to manage for. Fire is an important part of uh, the influence that shaped the vegetation of the Wachita Highlands and actually all of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, frequent fire has been here for thousands and thousands of years and our plant communities have grown adapted to fire. Uh, many of the endemic species in the Wachita Highlands and the Ozarks that are declining are declining because of the lack of fire. Fire is important to ecosystem health and that's not to say that we uh, want to uh, promote wildfire. Uh, we're definitely opposed to, to uncontrolled wildfire because it can be very destructive to, to people, their lives, and property, and to wildlife as well. We call prescribed fire prescribed for a reason because it's, it's set with specific management goals in mind. And uh, as such as you've seen, it can be a tremendous tool for ecologists, for livestock producers, for timber managers, and for wildlife managers on lands around the state. If you're interested in finding out more about prescribed burning on private lands, contact your county extension office or local NRCS office. And the State Forestry Division's website has a wealth of information and advice on conducting prescribed burning on private property. Be sure to bookmark this address. For those of you in eastern Oklahoma, east of Highway 69 that fall in the State Forestry Division's Fire Protection Area, you'll need to call one of these phone numbers for authorization and guidelines before conducting a prescribed burn. We'll see you next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.